Bible, please uh, open it. Let's read from 11 onwards, 5-11. Can one of you please read? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to chapter 6, verse 8. Oh, a long, long portion. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a little long, not, not that long, um, but about 10 verses. Go ahead. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers to come to the elementary truths of God's word all over the place. You need milk, not solid. Anyone who lives on milk, uh, being still an infant, is not acquainted with teaching about righteousness. But solid food for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Go ahead to six. Yeah. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teaching about Christ and be taken forward. Purity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts of death and of faith in God. Instructions about sensing right and the laying of and laying on of and resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment and God permitting we will do so. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, the powers of the tongues of God, and who have fallen away to be brought back to the earth. To their loss, they are crucified the Son of God all over again, subjecting him to public land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces the crop useful to those for whom it uh, receives the best God. But land that produces corns and thistles is worthless and nature of being heard. In the end, it will be heard. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so, this is the passage that uh, we have to discuss, um, and especially the issue. The debate is about verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all, or, all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So this is the passage, uh, our, the way we consider, uh, the, you know, our discussion is actually uh, is centered. So this is also, we know that this is one of the, a uh, famous warning passage. I said yesterday, there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews, and this is one among them, right? The issues involved, the spiritual status of those described, and the precise nature of the warning or threat. What is the nature of the warning? And what is the spiritual status of those people that are described here is the question, All right? So, uh, the first, there are four views on this passage. The first view says, this is talking about saved people. For example, it says they have tasted, they have once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit. So this is talking about saved people, but then lost. So 
salvation is is lost here uh, there are some commentators on the name of this like uh, Cockrell, Lansky, Marshall, McKnight, Aubrey, and these are all uh, from Pentecostal background or third world, third wave movement. Right, they are coming from most of them, uh, you know, Pentecostals, and they say this is talking about a passage that tells that yes, salvation can be lost because. Uh, it says, if they fall away, so falling away from the grace is equal to salvation is being lost. So according to them, four to five describe conversion as do the phrases elsewhere in the passage. Yes, chapter two, verse nine, three, one, all talks about salvation. This is also talking about salvation. For, for example, let's Maybe let's look at uh, chapter 2, verse 9 for a minute. 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was, who was made little lower than the angels, now crowned with the glory and honor, because of his death, that may, so that the, by the grace of God, we might taste death for everyone. And let's look at 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, Share in the heavenly calling. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess, so taste of the heavenly uh, you know, calling. So comparing that with the, the Hebrews 4, yes, this is talking about saved people. Now, in your past, in your chapter 6, verse, four, verse 6 describes apostasy, right? Verse 6 describes apostasy. What is verse 6 says in chapter 6? If they fall away to be brought back to repentance, right, falling away is apostasy. That is rejection of the faith once professed, resulting the loss of salvation and eternal judgment. So what, what do they say is this. Yes, these people, they believed in Christ Right now, they went back to Judaism, so they they became apostate. Right, they rejected the faith, rejected the faith, and uh, therefore, and because they they went back to Judaism, so it is apostasy. Therefore, what what is this? What is the result? The result is loss of salvation. Right. You believed in Christ, you rejected the faith, went back to, uh, you know, the old way of life. You lost your salvation. Very plain and simple. A simple way of explaining that passage. What are the problems then? The problem is, this interpretation conflicts with eternal security taught as well. Let's look at John 10.28. Open your Bibles to Gospel of John. Twenty-eight and twenty-nine thirty. John ten. All right. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, and thirty. Can one of you please read? Any aid? Okay. I will read. You know, take. I give them eternal life. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the Father are one. one. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, right? Never perish. They will never perish. They will never go back. They will never perish, right? 
So if according to this view, of course, Romans 8, 20, it also talks about for those whom he, he called, he justified, those whom he justified, he also well, sanctified, and sanctified, he also glorified. So you have those verses right there. And if you read, uh, uh, you know, it talks about election uh, and who can be against of those whom God elected, I uh, can tribulation, you know. So it is a wonderful passage when you get time to look at, uh, deals with the security of salvation. So according to this view, salvation can be lost and regained, right? Because why it is impossible for those to be saved again? Now, those who teach, those who teach that salvation can be lost also believe that salvation can be regained, right? But this passage actually says it is impossible to regain the salvation. Usually the, their response is either this is an unpardonable sin and therefore restoration is impossible for man but not for God. <laughs> All right? However, the other use impossible in Hebrews allow no exception. So they say, yeah, it is impossible for men to come back because most usually Pentecostalism also side with Armenianism. Pentecostalism also goes with Armenianism. And therefore, say, yes, we, they say we can, we do, we, uh, you know, it is our effort in salvation that is usually... Uh, most of the you know, Pentecostal writers have got that problem also. So I'm saying this is not not low, you know not really uh, right at all because Bible clearly says those who are saved, if God, if they are genuinely saved, the salvation cannot be lost. So if according to Pentecostals, so they believe that it is possible to regain salvation, then why Bible say it is impossible? Now, they said maybe this is an unpardonable sin, a sin that is uh, absolutely so heinous that God will never forget, right? Maybe something like that. But, so that is the first view. What is the second view? Second view says, yes, they are saved, right? These people who, who, who came to believe in Messiah, Jesus, now they went back to Judaism. So what do they say? Yeah, they are saved, but what are they going to lose? They will lose reward. Salvation will not be lost. Reward will be lost if you backslide. So they believe, yeah, you can you, you backslide. They believe that you can backslide. You can go back and you lose only your reward. Especially, uh, you know, here are some others like um, Horges, Zane Horges, uh, Joseph Dilo. These are all uh, basically coming from, you know, the world professors of uh, Dallas Theology Seminaries, old, and, old professors, and, have, you know, have basic, basically uh, have come up with some kind of absolutely wrong teachings, um, uh, you know, if you really study their their understanding of salvation. Uh, so, you know, like uh, Joseph Dilo and Hort just kind of, they would say there is, a, there is a kind of purgatory, a third place uh, for believers. You know, a third place for believers uh, they, they, where, where you will suffer for some time and then go to heaven. Uh, and so well, there are a lot of teachings for these people. Uh, but I don't have time to discuss them all, but uh, yes. So they believe that, yes, you can believe in Jesus as one time and go back from that faith. You will be still be saved. All what will happen is that you will lose your reward. That's it, right? So what do they say? Verse 4 to 5 describes conversion. Verse 6 describes a falling away from faithfulness, right? Because when you reject Christ, 
and go back to that world custom and judaism and be similarly there is no faithfulness maybe some allows for apostasy or for true believers resulting loss of reward right loss of reward so a uh, lot of people believe this theory i mean a lot of evangelicals believe the same this idea all, all what we see is loss of reward but the problem with the passage is okay loss of faithfulness why is loss of faithfulness impossible to win you the first question because here passage clearly says it is impossible to renew the response is that restoration is impossible for men but not for god that is what they would say now men cannot renew the faithfulness it is possible for god again uses of impossible in hebrews allow no exceptions so um, they they have again the same idea of uh, pentecostal explanation of the passage it is impossible for men to renew back to the faithfulness but god can still do i don't know whether we get that message from when we you read that portion according to 36 and 14 all who are converted perceive persevere in faith ruling apostasy for believers now let's look at this one hebrews chapter 3 i i want us to read that one look at with me hebrews 3 can one of you please read we will read for 6 then 14 anyone but christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of a hope firm to the end yes you know it says Yes, Christ is faithful as the son of God's house, and we are His house, right? We are His house. If it says, if we hold on to our courage of hope, right? And maybe if you look at uh, some other translation, like for example, uh, NASB says, if confidence and our the boast of our hope form until the end until the end that means that means if you are a true believer you will hold the confidence in Christ till the end of your life then that that means you are a genuine born again child of god you will hold your confidence in Christ till the end let's look at verse 14 now or we have become sharers with Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firm to the end yes we have become partakers of Christ partakers of Christ right or in nav says we have come to share in christ the idea is that you are united in christ provide us if we hold firmly the confidence that we had in the beginning when you trusted till the end so these two passages clearly rule out that a true believer will that slide it rule out it it says it is you know it says no true believer will never backslide and now we need to look at uh, this verse again the other warning passages identify the consequences of falling away right if anyone falls away warning passages says that it is to eternal judgment anyone falls away they fall away to eternal judgment how do we know let's look at one more time 
those warning passages where it is written. Let's look at 411. This, maybe this is the second passage, right? Second warning passages. 411. What is verse 411, Saz? Hebrew 411, sir? Yes. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Yes, and the example is taken from the Old Testament. Let anyone fall through the false example of disobedience, right? Let no. Now let's look at verse 10, chapter 10, verse 27. 10, 27. We yesterday we read this one. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will consume the adversaries. Yes, if anyone deliberately sin, what is the willing deliberate sin? It is going back, rejecting the faith in Christ, going back to the Judaism. What remains? A certain terrifying expectation of judgment. The fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries, right? That is what chapter 10 and says, you persevere till the end, continue in the faith till the end. Look at verse 39. 39 of the same chapter. But we are not of those who draw back destructions, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Yes, it says, yes, we, we are not those who swing back to distraction. Those who swing back to distraction. What kind of distraction is that one? Look at the next phrase. But to those who have faith to be the preserving of the soul. And Ivy says, those who believe and save. So distraction is on one side. Saving is another side. So the destruction is opposite of salvation. That is terrible judgment. Let's, let's look at chapter 12, verse 15 as well. Twelve fifteen. Watch carefully so that no one misses out of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up to trouble you and defies many. Yes, it has defied. So it says... All right, let's so right and nice be says to the no one comes short of the grace of God, and no root of bitterness bringing up causes trouble, and why many defile. So, so by looking at if you look at all these warning passages, and if you look at the context, it's a simply it's a clearly says consequences of falling away as eternal. Judgment. To so anyone backslide, hell is waiting. Right? right? So the first two is uh, saved and lost. Salvation can be lost. This passage talks about losing your salvation. Second view says this passage is talking about not losing your salvation, but losing your reward. Third view says this passage is talking about saved, right? But hypothetical apostasy and the loss of salvation. It is not loss of salvation. It is hypothetical. What is hypothetical? Imaginative apostasy. It's not true apostasy. Imaginative. Like, uh, you know, Guthrie is there, uh, Kent's, Wiry, Schweiner, you know, they all think, all right. So they, they believe verse four to five describe conversion. Verse six describes apostasy, but resulting in the loss of salvation and eternal judgment that is right. However, it is a hypothetical. Why it is hypothetical? Because it says, if they fall away, it is impossible, right? So they say, True believers cannot commit to this apostasy if they fall away. So it is a hypothetical falling, hypothetical going back 
imaginative going back. It is not true. It is imaginative. What is the problem with that theory? If falling away in verse 6 is not conditional statement, that if is not conditional, but it is a hypothetical. It's not a conditional statement, contrary to what is argued with the hypothetical view. Right? It is it, all right. Verse 6 is not a conditional statement, contrary to what is argued with the hypothetical view. According to Hebrew 10 25, what do you read? Some had already committed the sin. Look at, I will quickly read that one. What is what is the author says? Um, verse 10, 25. Now, the, we, we always do use this word. Not forsaking our own assembling together. Right? What is the background? Some Jewish people already started to do it. Right? So he says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. And he says, but encouraging one another and all the more. And as you see that, so you read a chapter 10 together. What happened? Right? People started to, you know, there are Jewish people believed in Christ. They started to come together to worship Jesus. But now they no longer come. This is all says already habit of some. So it is not that easy to say it is a hypothetical situation. It is the true situation. Some people have already rejected the faith and went back to Judaism. That is the reason they, were, they did not come to the church, to the, to the meeting of the church. All right. So uh, that is the uh, the third argument. So I don't think it is a hypothetical. That is a true situation, right? You know, I would start it, all right. Not saved, irretrievably lost. The fourth group, fourth view on this. So let's go back again to understand. First group says saved, but they are lost. Salvation can be lost. Second group says saved, but this passage is talking about loss of reward. Third group says they are saved, but it is not really, it is hypothetical apostasy, not real apostasy. But fourth group says, right? Fourth now, fourth group says this is not talking about save the people. This is professing believers, claiming believers, they claim to be believers, but genuinely not born again. Therefore, irretrievably lost. Let's look at it. So the, all right, uh, what is... Verse 4 to 5 describes not genuine faith, but professing faith, but not truly converted. Not truly converted. Verse 6 describes apostasy resulting in irreversible eternal judgment. Yeah, because they claimed that they trust Messiah. We believe in this resurrected Messiah. But when persecution came, what did they do? Oh, no, 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 no. This is sad. We cannot. Why should we give priority to this Messiah? Then our life, our life is important. So it's better we go back to our Judaism and stay there so that we don't have to face persecution. So they are professing believers, not genuine. Therefore, they are irreversible laws. What is the problem? Problem is, you know, this group says they have not saved. But words four and five are used elsewhere for conversion. Right? What is verse four and five in chapter six says? Chapter six, verse four, four and five 
It says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. How can you say, this is not talking about saved people, rather professing believers. How can you say? Because elsewhere in the Bible, it seems that this is clear description of saved people. So how? So that is the first problem this theory faced for the theory. If the next point, if renewing again to repentance in verse 6, right? Because verse 6 says, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance uh, because to, to their laws, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and rejecting, right? So in renewing again to repentance, verse 6 is the remedy. Does not again suggest that they said, I don't want time, repented already and were saved. It says renewing again them to repentance. Does it not suggest that word again that they were already saved? All right. So that is the two problem we face. If you say this is talking about professing believers. The conclusion. The phrases in verse 4 and 5 are ambiguous or inconclusive. I would say, I would say, verse 4 and 5, not necessarily, not all the time, necessarily describe true believers. It might, it can, for example, yes, let me, you look at that verse again. What is the verse? Says? It is impossible to do, for those who have once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God, powers of the coming age. What I, what we conclusion, what I say here, of course, they can describe true believers, but let me also say, they can also describe those who profess faith or those who associate with believers, those who witness miracles but not genuinely saved. Think about Judas. Judas in Matthew 10. Uh, you, you know, open your Bibles to Matthew 10. Matthew 9, the last two verses, says 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his field. Verse 1 of chapter 10. He called how many? How many? To all his disciples. Right? To all disciples to him. And gave them authority to drive out evil spirits. And heal every disease and sickness. How many? How many One. disciples? Twelve. Look at verse four. In that twelve, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. What do you see? The ability to perform miracles were given to 12, including Judas. Yes. He was able to, you know, you know Bible doesn't talk much about the ministry, but the, 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 you know, the power, the authority to drive out evil spirits, heal every diseases and sickness was given to all the 12, 
irrespective of their spiritual capacity. So he said, uh, you know, partakers of the Holy Spirit, powers of the age to come. That is right here, right? That the power of the kingdom, coming kingdom, that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 40. Jesus, Jesus shown to the Israelites by sending this 10, uh, sending this 12 apostles, 12 disciples, and they healed every sick, right? Powers of the age. They were part of the band of 12, right? But Judas was son of perdition, son of distraction, lost. But, but Baker, yes. So he said in the Bible, yes. Let's, and, and let's look at Simon the Magus in Acts 8. What do, you, what do you read about him? If you read Acts 8, you see Simon himself also believed. Uh, second, you see, he was also baptized. Read Acts 8. And why? Why did he do all these things? Yeah, he believed he baptized his He's part of the church. He's in the church. He's a member of the church. And then he gives little money to Peter and say, you know, I want that power in that when I lay hands on the people, they should get the Holy Spirit. What did Peter say? Let your money be perished with you. And Peter said, you pray to the Lord. to say it. And Simon says, why don't you pray for me? He was unable to pray. Right? That is what a professing believer. And Jews in Hebrews 3, if you look at Hebrews 3, there are many Jewish people now who came to Jesus are uh, like on the way of going back. They were part of the church, shared the testimony, maybe part of the part of the Bible study group, part of a disciple making group, part of everything. What happened? They went back. And that is the reason in chapter three and in chapter four, three and four, we read, we read. That the author of Hebrews says, we are partakers in Christ if we hold fast our confidence till the end. Till the end. And in Hebrews 12, let's go to chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Um, let's look at verse 17. 12 verse 17. Let's, okay. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to receive the blessing, he was rejected. Though he earnestly sought it with tears, he found no place for change of mind. Hmm. Uh, this talk him a while. If you look at Verse 16, he says, you see, well, you know, this is a, the, the final warning passage, right? Mm -hmm. And verse 15 says, so to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. And verse 16 says, see that no one is sexually immoral. Or is godless like Esau? Talking to Jewish people, right? Godless like Esau. For a single meal sold his inheritance right as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. 
he could bring about no change of mind though he saw the blessing with the tears he could change his mind so these examples clearly what you know examples are brought there right so we can say verse 4 to 5 definitely describe true believers usually but they can also describe those who profess faith like judas simon the Magus, or some jewish people in hebrews 3 or esau in hebrews 12 and renew again under repentance does not mean that their early repentance was saving repentance never for example judas repented yeah he, he wept, but did he, yeah, he changed his mind, right? Changed his mind, but not, he did not turn to God. He was sorry for his sin. Was Judah sorry? He was. That's the reason he went and hanged. So, so yes, people who are in jail, they will repent several times. Somebody murdered somebody else. One, you know, what they do, they repent. And they say, I'm sorry for what I have done. But repentance doesn't mean that they repent to Christ. It doesn't mean. Not only change of mind is important, right? Repentance that should lead one to salvation, which means. You need to repent and turn to God. Yeah. So Hebrew 12, 17, he out in a, we, we read now, he could not, he could bring about no change of mind, though he sought a blessing. And Acts chapter 11, also you can look at read where, you know, how you have Peter is talking about this. So, repentance, not only away from idols, but to God is important. Nevertheless, this repentance is still decided as a foundation for true repentance. So, renew them again into repentance is not an issue. There, people can repent of their sin without changing their mind about God. They may be changing their mind about their sin, it doesn't mean that they change their mind about God. All right. So, there are a lot of people that think that oh, they have done wrong, but they don't come to God. Right? Many people uh, think like that. And we, I also say, verse 7 and 8 illustrate contrast between salvation. Right? What is 7 and 8 in Hebrews chapter 6? Seven and eight, it says, let land that drinks in the rain often fall, falling on it and produces a crop useful for those whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. So the land that produces fruit, that is perseverance. And that land that produces thorns and thistles Eternal judgment, waiting for fire, right? It says the land, verse 8, land that produces thorns and thistle, worthless and in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So it is not talking about uh, like salvation loss. It's talking about professing people who claiming to believe no fruit at all. Verse 9 indicates that previous verses were describing things not pertaining to salvation, right? Um, verse 9 says, even though we speak this, dear friends, we are confident of better things, in your case, things that accompany salvation. Not that other people distances you readers by using third person in actual warnings, right? Rather than the first or second person he he does in the verses both before and after. But we are talking about verse 9 uh, in chapter 5. Look at verse 9 and 5. 
once made perfect, he became source of eternal salvation for those who obey him. Right? He is eternal salvation for those who obey, those who persevere, those who continue in the faith. The other one in passage in Hebrew argue for eternal judgment as the consequences of failure to heed the warning. Right? Warning is, do not go back to Judaism. If you go, eternal punishment is the result. So warning passages are one of the means God uses to cause true believers to persevere in faith and to warn those wavering to examine themselves in the dangers of apostasy. So I think the, the last view, that is fourth view, is the right one. They, it is talking about not saved irretrievably lost idea is it's talking about professing believer not genuine believers and they they taste like all other believers but they reject the faith go back and what is remaining for them eternal judgment and I personally believe that Every and any genuine believers will continue in their faith till the end. And a faith, a continuing faith till the end tells that they are saved. The question is, well, it's not when you began your Christian life. That's not the question. The question is, are you a believer now? Are you a child of God till you die? Will you be? That is the question. It, it, a lot of people give a lot of importance for the beginning. They want to write it down, the date. Nothing wrong in that. They wanted to, you know, make it big the day that they trusted Nothing wrong to see it as a grace from God and as an appreciation for God's grace. But friends, the main focus is, it's not whether you were a Christian yesterday. That's the, not the focus. Are you a genuine Christian today? And will you be till the last breath of your life? You are not able to continue in the faith and you go back. You are, you are going, to, going toward a sinful life. Never expect that you will be in heaven when you die. Oh, I, I, I was baptized that day, so I should be in heaven. I was a believer that day, so I should be in heaven. No. Your confession or your baptism or church membership will never make you a believer. It is simply God's work. Change up a new heart. God's work in your heart. Changing you to believe the word of God as God's own very word. And you are willing to obey God. That is the important thing. And you are willing to obey till the end. Till the last breath. Because hmm. professing believers will stop sometime later. Remember, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me close because I don't have time to go to the Old Testament or the prophets today because I need to have, I need to stop little early today. So let me tell you one more story. Right? Uh, it is from Matthew 13. Parable of the sower. Jesus says, you know, a man went to sow the seed. Some fell on the wayside. Some fell on the rocky place, some fell among the thorns. 
Tony Blair, right? Tony Blair. And some fell on a prepared, I say prepared play land. And you will see there was only one place that is prepared, prepared. And the seed that was so on the wayside, the raw, thorny, yeah, Satan comes and take away, no root, persecution comes, chokes them out, dies, everything dies, it doesn't produce fruit. There is no fruit, but the seed that was fell on a prepared ground produced fruit. That is the genuine, genuine believers. These are all has to be considered as professing believers. And I know that maybe you might have heard a sermon like saying these are all various types of believers. No. They're not various types. They're not genuine believers. They are professing people because of various things. They just lose their love of God. They go away. Prepare the ground, there is only one. Where the, the ground, the heart that God has prepared through regeneration, when the seed of the word of power, the gospel is for it will react. There will be fruit, there will be faith and repentance, genuine. They will believe. It's not that they will believe, they will continue to believe, and they will produce a fruit. That's the important thing. They will persevere till the end. Persevere. They will continue in the faith till the end. That is what we you also understand right from the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. All right, I think uh, that's a one of the main interpretive problems in, in the book of Hebrews. The other one about the uh, you know atonement efficacy. Okay, the blood of, blood of bulls and goats will not take away the sins. So what about the Old Testament sacrifices? Is it effective? Was it effective in the Old Testament? And remember, uh, just think about the discussion that we said. There were simply symbols of the coming second. Sacrifice. We were talking about temple in the millennial kingdom and uh, and the sacrifice in the millennial kingdom. We talked about why it's simply symbolic. All these sacrifices were symbolic in nature. In the time. Right? And so uh, uh, that is what we have discussed. And the church and the new covenant, please look into the dispensationalism. We discussed that also. All right. So, any questions you have now? Yes, Pastor. Go ahead. Yes, Pastor. You Please. said when uh, a person repents of the sin, he is changing his mind about the sin, but not changing the mind about God. You, I mean, a lot of people are like that. Okay. Now, I want to know the difference between the repentance of a believer and repentance of a unbelievable uh, professing believer professing, uh, and professing let's take, believer yeah let's take a repentance of an unbeliever okay right? okay an unbeliever you know i mean someone who murdered someone who did like rape and he's in jail for years and there are a lot of people you know you go there and you talk to them what do you think about your action they will say i am very sorry it is out of emotions out of anger, I did what I did, but I'm very sorry. So he doesn't repent. He's not sorry because he doesn't think that what he has done is a violation of God's word. God's word, right? That is what an unbeliever, like, for example, Judas was an unbeliever. Because he, he was very sorrowful. What you know when he betrayed Jesus, very sorrowful. Judas, if he was, if he was 
genuine believer, what he would have done, he would have come to Jesus and asked to pardon for what he has done. Pardon for what he has done. And he has never done that. Look at Simon the Magnus. Um, Peter is saying, let your money be perished with you. Ask, look, uh, one second, let me let me show you that verse from Acts. It, it is quite interesting, Acts chapter 8. Um, uh, where is that? Yes, yes, verse 13, 13 onwards, Acts chapter 8, verse 13 onwards. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere. Astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them and they might, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them as they had been, as they had only simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw the Spirit, look at verse, verse 18 now. When the Simon saw the Spirit was given at laying the hands on the apostles' hand, he offered them money. Verse 19, and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Verse 22 now, very interesting how Peter says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Right? Verse 23, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Look at how Peter explains. Then, now look at Simon's answer. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said might happen to me. Right? So, clear. Here is a professing believer. A professing believer will never be hardy. Like, a professing believer will... He will pretend to repent, but deep in his heart, he has different aim, different agenda. It is not that he wants to be reconciled to God and love God. He is looking for something. He's not looking for Jesus. He's looking for something, not looking for Jesus. And there is, an, there is not a genuine relationship with Jesus. There's no genuine love. So I would say there are a lot of people repent like they're sorrow about sin. How about if a genuine repentance, they should be sorrowful that they violated the words of Jesus, right? That should that should be a genuine repentance. And and if you look at the ultimate indicator of a true believers is that they will continue to repent till the last, till the end. Continue to repent because repentance is not a one time act. It is a continuous, continuous action that you recognize the alias of failure on a daily basis and, and ask the Lord for forgiveness 
and and change your mind on that issue. So uh, that is what um, the true thing. So a professing believer will have something else in his mind. That means it is not coming from a genuine heart. That's what I would say. Thank you. Pastor, some people like uh, missionaries. Uh, I read uh, one missionary went to a remote place, African place, and he lost wife and children also. Only one daughter survived, and uh, she came away back to US. But this missionary, um, he was there for many many years, and uh, none were saved. But he had come away, and then he become like he taken to alcohol also, and he was living alone. And later, his daughter came to know, and daughter started coming, and then I looked after him, and he was back, like he repented, and and then he died. So sometimes there can be a face after like. Oh yeah. Okay, well, the question is, will a genuine believer will sin? Absolutely, I understand that. Can a genuine believer in a in a in a in a time or a season of sinfulness? Could yeah. be, could be. Could be. Think then... about, yeah, think about think about David. Mm, yes. Uh, if you think about David, David was in the mode of adultery yeah. at least for a year because it looks like it's not only that he he killed Uriah yeah. and and adult had adultery with Bathsheba he took her as his his wife and it looks like he had a child yeah. and so it is it is it's some time like Right, but now you see God is sending Nathan the prophet mm. and sending you know the word to him. God is mm. speaking to him, and he repents. Right, uh, so can can there be sin in the believers? That's the reason. Yes. Now imagine, imagine David was in that sin. And he continued to sin, never come back. Then you will, you, yes, he had anointing, he had a theocratic anointing, but he, it's like Saul. Think about Saul. Compare David and Saul. You know, you see, David was called as a man after God's own heart. That's right. You know, if you look at his life, look at his the way that he saw God, read him. You will be astonished, like amazing, the, the, his love for God. But there wasn't a, in a time, period of time that it was a darkness, right? Darkness, completely darkness. And now this man cries like a baby for the sin that he had committed, Psalm 51, receiving forgiveness from the Lord and saying, about Psalm 32, how he happy, blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are, for, you know, covered. Yes. And look at all the Psalms and the, you will see how much he loved God. But look at Saul. Look at Saul. A man whom God anointed to be the, to be the king of Israel, the first, the first man. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it is, it was there. But look at him, the end. Look at the end of Saul. He was half-heartedly obeyed. He was half obedient. And what was the end? The end was with the witchcraft. Mm, yes. Not with God. With witchcraft. That is a professing believer. Mm. Right? He was not genuinely saved. Saul was not genuinely saved. I don't think so. Because mm -hmm. we know that theocratic anointing can come to you know, anyone whom God chooses. And here God chose one per person, but God, you know, never glorified him. And the theocratic anointing 
right? The, the specific anointing that God gave to Saul that had come from Judges upon Saul. Now it is going away from Judges now to David. Right? Yeah. So I'm I'm saying, yeah, just you know, both of them are examples. So it is not how you begin Christian life. You know, some people, some people in their you know li life of faith, they, they begin like a rocket mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they fall like a rock. Mm -hmm. That's what happens, and no way they, they don't come out of it because that is what happens to uh, uh, professing believers. They begin, you know, if you look at their beginning, it is a what a story, what a conversion story. It's a story to tell. But then the story doesn't make any sense to them. Right? Because they simply depended on that experience they had in the beginning. Not coming to the scripture, to the word, to the revelation of God. And there's a problem. So, uh, it's a classic example, Saul and David. Yeah. How David you know, the mystery story doesn't end there. Yeah. Actually, there was one who uh, got converted after this missionary left. Uh, and, yeah. and afterwards, uh, through him, the church is established. Yeah, I know, I know whom you are talking about, yeah. yeah. And he comes to know all of it, yeah. And, and another thing, and it's interesting, that, you know, remember the other day I said there was a pastor who preached for 10 years mm -hmm. in a church. And then one day when he was preparing his old sermon, First time he realized that there was no genuine, hearty relationship with God. And he repented. And the stories are there in the church history like that. So, um, because it's easy when you grow up, especially among Christ believing families, right? Christian parents, raising of children, it's easy to feed. This myth. What is a myth? Yeah. Myth is confess, baptize. Heaven is sure. <laughs> That's a myth, not biblical. Oh, I'm baptized. Fine. It's not the question of how you began. The question actually is how did you end? That, tell, that will tell you who you are, I would say. Yeah. So, sure. Thank you. And, and what do you say? Anything else? Just look at my mind. Thank you. So I have got an insight that while we're taking up classes, you see, uh, this Hebrew while we're studying. Mm, so the person, the adversary is very powerful. It's, it'll come either the way of persecution or the false teaching. I mean, the professing Christians that uh, they got involved in the church and then they were uh, perverting the believers. Uh, we can con uh, Is it true that that uh, we can think uh, like that? Because that this is the insight that while we were, uh, you know, I was listening to you that I've got. The adversary is more powerful. It will, but uh, the, our faith is always tested. Our tested faith is blessed faith. Yes. Okay, so that uh, the, the uh, uh, no, we can see the you know this, there are a lot of uh, examples in the chapter eleven that is the faith is tested. Yeah. So yeah. so this we need to the complete perseverance. Perseverance comes and you know, in the Christian faith and you no know, perseverance that yeah. we have to. Yeah. You know, so the Christian will be <clears throat> will a genuine believer persevere till the end. Right, that is a question, and the answer is absolutely yes till the end. Because remember why we do believe that Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete till on that day. Right? Number two. Adversary is so powerful, but John would say, first John, he who is in you is greater than what is outside. That's how you win this battle. You have to have a, you have to 
And so I would say, yes, adversity is powerful, but the one who is in us is much, much more powerful than, uh, than who is outside. And therefore, yeah, it's a hold on. You know, it's a warning given to us. The, the warning, the, this is a threat. It is a, it is a warning that if the author of Hebrews to everyone, every giant in the faith. The warning comes to every giant in the faith. You could be a giant today and you will never know that how Satan will use one of your weakness and destroy it. And so, yes. Um, so I think uh, it is mentioned the importance of local church and the having fellowship. You know, it's mentioned in the Hebrew. Yes. And uh, the caring and sharing and love and everything is mentioned because these are all that when uh, I was listening that it has come up in my mind. It's some okay. like an insight so that I'm sharing it. Sure. Uh, so that I thought that it will be helpful that I'll share it. So yeah. that I'm sharing. That's all. okay. Now, I can add this one because according to the Bible, there is no genuine Christian life you can have without a local church life. There's, there's no Christian life without a local church. I mean, some people say, this is my personal spirituality. No, not really. Spirituality is not simply personal. Uh, that's one thing that we, we looked at in philosophy of church ministry. Spirituality is, is uh, corporate. Like, I mean, you cannot be spiritual by being alone. According to God, God's word, Church, God brought church family so that you can grow in that family. So, so uh, there is no Christian life without a local church. We need to serve, be accountable, work for the local church because that is the place where God works today. Not, not like it's, church is not a kingdom. It is it's a family of God. And therefore, yes, I would say that's the reason. Remember, in Hebrews chapter ten, verse twenty-five, we read, uh, "You know, as some people do, why the yes. warning was right there." Yes, yes. Because, yeah. These people have gone away to Judaism, and they were no more coming to the church. And so Paul, you know, not Paul, the other Hebrews looks at us so severe that not being assembling together is a sign of apostasy. And that means maybe they are professing people. That's what he's saying. And, uh, and therefore, he's warning them in chapter 10 is that fiery, fiery is waiting for them. That's what it's uh, So it's so important. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. Let me pray because I need to go now. Uh, because of my, you know, I have to take my daughter from the school uh, within a few minutes. So let me go back. Let me pray. Father, we thank you. The warning is genuine. It's real. And it is not the question how long we trusted. The question is, how about today? How about tomorrow? Till the end of our life. So, Lord, we pray. Yes, there are times of failures, times of sin in our lives. That you know, Lord, but you look, you look at our heart. Was our heart genuine when God intervened? Or did we pretend? Help, Lord, that we will be genuine, open heart to the Lord and to the world. And we will tell everything to the Lord in prayer including our weakness, our sin, or any problems that we face so that we have forgiveness, right relationship, that we grow on to maturity. So thank you once again for everyone who joined us today. Thank you for your grace in, this life, in the lives of these dear ones. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.